Years after lockdowns forced most people to stay home, many workers are holding on to the remote work lifestyle. But many employers are itching to bring their employees back in person more often, as many office buildings sit empty. A concern for both companies and city budgets, which rely heavily on tax revenue from those buildings. Can workers be persuaded to ditch their home offices and lapdogs? Or is this the new normal? I'm joined by Raj Chowdhury, Associate Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School, who studies the effects of remote work, and Jim Rooney, CEO of Greater Boston's Chamber of Commerce. Raj, help me frame this discussion. Why are so many offices mandating the return to work? So I guess partly because uh, old habits die hard, but I would uh, you know, just remind uh, business leaders that there is a very strong reason flexible work is sticking, and that is because this is a talent strategy. So if any organization wants to keep attracting and retaining high-quality, diverse talent, this has to be permanent. So... Jim, so far, how much of that return to office has actually happened? What's happening to the value of, real, of office real estate in Boston that what might tell us how many people are actually using the offices they used to come into every day? Well, the value of buildings as measured by the, the transfer of those buildings in recent years has gone down. Um, that's clear. From an occupancy perspective, uh, we've got about a 17% occupancy rate, not least in downtown Boston. And uh, on any given week, um, there's about 65% uh, of the people actually coming into the into the workplace. But as you suggest, employers are trying to require more time uh, in the office and actually implementing ways to try to enforce that. So, Raj, is there an argument for this time in the office, for the time in the office that it might see be more important than you might first say? My, my wife observes that when people she hires, if they haven't spent time in the office, they've sort of missed out on the mentorship opportunities that they would normally have had. So it's sort of a common observation that people who are in, very early in their career can be actually years behind they would be expected to be because they missed out on that. Yeah, so two points here. So there's no denying that we need in-person time. But the scientific evidence that's emerging, including a study that we published, uh, which is an experiment we ran over nine weeks, uh, suggests that about 25% to 40% of the days should be in person. Now, we need more experiments like that. And I think the truth is that, you know, we don't have to be back every day. And the 25% days in our study uh, need not be every week. Uh, so there are many organizations and teams that are meeting for one entire week every month. There's an off-site model that's catching on. Uh, so there are other ways to organize in person. Okay. So, so, Jim, if there are so many other ways to do this, why the push to bring people back? I think State Street just announced that they want all of their people back in the office five days a week. Yeah, State Street has moved to um, um, more required days in the office. I think that we need more data than to make conclusions about you know, the brief period of time we've had since post-pandemic era. Certainly people did merge their personal lives with their work lives in terms of what they would prefer to do. Uh, that being said, I think people <coughs> who experience leading uh, teams of work, while it may be all habits die hard, as I suggested, um, you know, they, they understand how to nurture one's career, how to create those mentorship opportunities, how much networking, connecting with each other. And the fact of the matter is that for a long, a long period of time, our business systems, our ways of managing assumed an in-office environment. And there's a number of things going on, and the business community will adjust to this over time. Uh, there's this desire on some people's part to work from home, but there's also different ways of getting functions done. There's outsourcing, there's gig economy workers, there's contractors. And the, and the challenge right now, and this will be a big management experiment, I think, for the next five years or so, is how do you manage this remote workforce in combination with what's going on uh, in the workplace? How do you merge the two and how do you do it effectively? Raj, what's the key pieces of advice you'd give to managers for that? And what are the key pieces of advice you'd give to workers who are now dealing with this new partially remote environment? Yeah, so first of all, I would agree with several things that Jim uh, said. Uh, first, we need more data. Uh, it, it is also going to be a lot of bottom-up experimentation. 
So one advice uh, that you know I give the business leaders is that you have some top-down, uh, broad policies like twenty-five percent days could be in person, but you give teams the flexibility to experiment. So some teams could find a rhythm of going one day every week. Some other teams could find a different rhythm of going one entire week every month. So let all these experiments happen. Let's learn from the best practices. And the final thing I'll say, Gautam, is that, you know, we all have to have a North Star. And the North Star here is that this is good for companies because it allows companies to attract and retain better quality and diverse talent. So now just follow up on that. One of the issues that it's that's finding its way into the workplaces that are experimenting in that way is the broader issue of fairness that young employees in particular look for. So, for example, there are many jobs that have to be done in person. In fact, about 60 percent of the workforce, um, uh, other jobs in America require that they, they be done in person. So there's a there's a, a, a divide occurring between the can work from home and cannot work from home. And similarly within teams, teams that are given flexibility versus other teams, you know, you get this in the workplace chat about, well, what about us? How come they can do it that way, but we can't? Um, so the practical side of implementing this flexibility is right now a challenge that employers are working through. Uh, can I react to that, Gautam? Please do. So I totally agree with both the points. And the first point is that many of these RTO mandates do not function well because if you say come back three days a week and if Jim and I are on the same team and Jim shows up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and I show up Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, then actually we just have a day in common. So I completely agree that the in-person time should be scheduled in a way that the whole team shows up. And that's why I love the offsites because the offsites, if done intelligently, attract the whole team. On Jim's other point about the blue collar or, you know, some, a lot of workers cannot work remotely, there's actually a quiet revolution going on, which is the digital twins revolution. Uh, so what digi uh, digital twins are is it's a combination of sensors, automation, machine learning, and data on the cloud. And you can run hospitals, oil rigs, uh, factories, supply chain warehouses now remotely. So I, I completely expect the frontiers of remote work to expand into all of these settings, and it's going to become more fair. So, so Jim, I, also the shift in the workforce is going to have some pretty big implications for Boston as well. So the February, there's a February report by the Boston Policy Institute that said with the value of office space just expected to decline 20 to 30 percent by 2029, and overall commercial real estate prices by 12 to 18 percent. They're estimating that Boston's going to face a cumulative revenue shortfall of like almost as much as one and a half billion dollars over the next five years. And at the same time, as office space goes vacant, so Boston has this crippling housing shortage, and the NBER has said that converting empty offices to housing is financially feasible in Boston, along with New York, SF, San Jose, D.C., a few other cities. So what are the prospects of taking advantage of this shift in the workplace to actually try and resolve our housing shortage here and converting some of these buildings into housing? Well, I'm not sure the study that you referred to. I've, I've seen a study that says that given the um, building inventory, office building inventory in Boston, it's incredibly to, difficult to expect that some meaningful amount of it can easily be converted into uh, residential. There's a lot of physical characteristics of office building that don't, <clears throat> don't allow for that. Um, I think I saw numbers down in the 8 to 10 percent for Boston, but you have to be willing to pay the premium cost of of what it takes to do that, whether it's HVAC systems, windows, bathrooms, just practical stuff. Um, so I don't expect a lot of that to happen. There's a building near our office that's converting, but upon looking at it, it was once residential, moved to office, and is now going back to residential. So that kind of makes sense. Um, I know that we'll look at that, but it just seems to me that if, if it penciled out the way people are talking about it, Developers and investors would have done it already or be talking more about doing it. So if that's something we want to do, it's going to take some form of government, municipal, state or federal investment in cities to convert their buildings uh, in the way you're talking about. I don't see the market 
reacting um, in a big way to conversions. Raj, Jim, uh, I'll only say that my requirement for coming back to the office is that I would be allowed to be, bring my puppies in with me. So you guys need to make dog-friendly offices a requirement for all of your research and all your work going forward. And on that note, I'm sure that we're going to be talking about this more as we reshape the city. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.